Uh, okay, so today um, I want to talk about the movement of poetry, uh, and as such, I will talk about the movement of a kind of language, and a language I hope to show has something of the ontological in it. In part, it is ontological because it creates as poesis, it brings beings forth. And it does this through a, a movement that I, is ontological, that is, speaks to the being of beings in their ground and constitution. And this ontological movement is to be described in terms of oscillation. Um, now, oscillation is a concept that's at the heart of the ontology that I'm developing uh, in my dissertation, uh, something central to my research. Uh, but before I get into the thick of that, let me first just say that due to time constraints, uh, this presentation will assume some rather extensive knowledge of Kant and Heidegger, um, so that we might think more fully about the issue of poetry and its creative movement. Let me just briefly outline a few basic points that are, are necessary. So of course, uh, Kant and Heidegger are huge areas, so let me just kind of pick up the basic threads uh, that, that we'll need, right? So first, we just need to bear in mind the role of the imagination in Kant's account of cognition, of thinking. Any scholars of Kant will have to forgive this too brief, right? I mean, we can talk about this during the uh, Q&A. Everything that I'm going to say is going to go too fast um, and will probably be shocking uh, in some, some ways uh, uh, to us. So, um, of course, we will all should study Kant for like 10 years or something and then reconvene and talk about this again. So anyway, um, we, we note that the imagination serves as a mediator between under, uh, intuition and the understanding. It appears as an active element, and this functions in the series of syntheses Kant takes to be central to all possible experience. Intuition gives the manifold just whatever we happen to be directed toward, and the understanding supplies the concepts of the uh, supplies the concepts necessary to render the manifold sensible for us in experience, right? So the application of the concepts of the understanding to the manifold given in intuition is the work of the imagination, okay? Um, one further point about uh, Kant regarding the forms of intuition, uh, we know that space and time are the forms of outer and inner intuition, respectively. However, in the transcendental aesthetic of the first critique, Kant seems to favor time uh, because it is the inner form of intuition, and thus it reigns over all possible experiences in a way that space does not. Yet, when you get to the refutation of idealism, Kant moves to put space and time on equal footing, and this is really motivated by um, his arguments for empirical realism, which is a position he holds simultaneously with transcendental idealism. And of course, Kant is much more well known as a transcendental idealist, but he does hold this view of empirical realism um, along that, of course, the refutation of idealism, right? So um, uh, these are some main points about uh, Kant to sort of uh, keep in mind. So moving to Heidegger, of course, Heidegger wants to explain being in terms of time. And he turns to Kant in the years after the publication of Being in Time, especially to that cryptic se uh, section on the schematism, where Kant attempts to outline the process by which concepts are applied to intuition by the imagination, and also how it is we're able to render sensible these very rules of cognition, right, which are never given any outer shape or form or picture or anything like that. Since the rules are supplied by the understanding, they must come in the form of inner intuition, meaning that they are rooted in temporality, right? Um, at least that seems to be, that's what I take Heidegger's understanding of the situation to be, right? Um, and it also accounts for his intense interest in the schematism, right, as this temporality, right? Okay, so just one last point here. Uh, the imagination, I think, is the root source of spontaneity in both Kant's own works and in Heidegger's account in the 1929 Kant book. Uh, it's odd to me that translators of Kant dogmatically stick to the language of representing, since it's clear that experiences can be novel and have a sense of newness, that is, be presented or introduced, for Stellen, which is also related in colloquial German to imagining, right? Um, nevertheless, it is clear that the imagination does much more than merely to reproduce uh, the, the uh, sense uh, in the sense of repetition, right? Not just reproduction in the sense of a, of a repetition. Um, 
because that's just one type of synthesis that uh, the imagination performs. The other is a productive, right, synthesis. Uh, okay, all right, all right. Enough of, enough of all this uh, <laughs> background, right, right, enough of this. Um, so again, we can come back to any of this in the Q&A and flesh uh, out, I mean, all of this stuff is contentious and interpreters argue about all that kind of stuff, so. When I turn to poetry, I want to follow its movement as a movement of production. As I said, a creative movement. However, it's also clear that before the creative moment manifests, there is a kind of reproduction or repetition that occurs first uh, in time, first in time, not ontologically a priori. Right? The basic movement I want us to think about happens from an established basis, a common language, one that is taken for granted most of the time, and so the first step from this pre-established and largely uncritical uh, basis is one in which the basis is disturbed and destabilized. Uh, so Gianni Vatimo, in his consideration of both Heidegger and Walter Benjamin, focuses on this aspect of the work of art. But uh, he doesn't go far enough, because in this movement, one described as oscillation, Vatimo fails to recognize the other side of the movement. On the other side of destabilization, we arrive somewhere new, and this new understanding is as sensible, something stable. What poetry opens for us is an opportunity to see this movement in action, to experience for ourselves this destabilizing, stabilizing oscillation in which new being springs forth from the work of art. There's something phenomenological, and I'm afraid due to the constraints of academic conferences, um, I may not be able to take the audience through this movement during our short time together. However, I encourage you all to take this up in an exploratory, experimental fashion and read poetry carefully, closely, um, and in your reading, wait for these moments to come to you. This is not a conceptual scheme to be imposed on the work in order to glean its true significance. No, no, not at all. This is something that happens to us, happens to us, in an encounter with the poem as a work of art. This is something that comes in the experience of the reading that's not a controlled burn, but a conflagration in whose light the world is lit anew, which clears for us a new way of understanding and offers a glimpse of being and beings as the being we encounter stands forth, literally, Vorstellen, in this place opened by the movement of poetic language. Okay, so enough preliminaries. Uh, let's get to the poetry. Adrienne Wrench begins her poem in the wake of home with the following stanza. You sleep in a room with blue-green curtains, posters, a pile of animals on the bed, a woman and a man who love you and each other. Slip the door ajar. You are almost asleep. They crouch and turn to stroke your hair. You never wake. This happens every night for years. This never happened. In this stanza, everything is at stake. Being itself is at stake. It's a scene vaguely familiar to everyone in North America, yet it's not everybody's scene. It is the pretense of the universal childhood in a suburban space in a nuclear home. The next stanza breaks this illusion, emphasis, it should have been this way. That's not what you say. You so carefully not asking why. Rich holds us between two worlds, between two poles of comfort, implicit familiarity, and alienation. This is not your home. This is not your bedroom. This scene was laid out with a language taken for granted. In this instance, the language of the great American middle class. And yet, in his 1989 book, translated as the Transparent Society, Vadimo discusses oscillation in relation to art, taking up themes shared by Heidegger and Benjamin, Vadimo focuses in particular on the destabilizing power of oscillation that is to quote, directed toward keeping disorientation alive. Vadimo fo focuses on Heidegger's origin of the work of art. However, um, it's useful to confer with section uh, 40 of being in time and a further elucidation of fundamental modes or attunement, uh, moods, fundamental moods or attunements detailed in the 1929 lecture course published as uh, the fundamental concepts of metaphysics. Heidegger develops a notion of the Stoss, or blow, in relation to the work of art's destabilizing power, the same power by which the world breaks, uh, breaks down and reveals the essential groundlessness of its signification. Thus, according to Heidegger, an aesthetic experience opens us to the Seinfrage, the question of being, 
As Vadimo interprets it, uh, during an encounter with the work of art, an aesthetic experience, we are struck by this blow that destabilizes our normal way of understanding the world. And then uh, under this interpretation of Heidegger, the oscillation of the work of art faces us toward the abyss, where the certain and presumed validity of our normal ways of going about the world collapse and are called into question. And um, we realize the basic groundlessness, right, of our everyday understanding, right? We see the abyssal ground. Vadimo relates this notion of Stas to Benjamin's conception of shock. For Benjamin, shock is best represented in film, where one image is constantly usurped and replaced by another and another and so on. What ties the blow and the shock together is their mutual emphasis on disorientation, and specifically, one that is being shaped and coming into conflict with the technological apparatus developing in conjunction with urbanization and metropolitan life and so on. So for both Heidegger and Benjamin, by focusing on disorientation, they break from the previous aesthetic tradition, particularly followers of Kant and Hegel, in which aesthetic experience was reduced to formal relations in which one could repose. And this aesthetics is described in terms of Geborgenheit, uh, security organization and reorganization. So this is, seems to be how Fatima understands the relations here. So just as Derrida is struck by a blow, he struck a blow by the allegedly Aristotelian contretemps, oh my friends, there is no friend. Rich strikes with, this happens every night for years, this never happened. There is no room for repose. Here, oscillation holds us between these two contrary statements. The illusion of the universal is both affirmed and shattered in a breath. And the very next stanza confirms, quote, the home houses, mirages, memory fogs the window panes. But we do not stop here. There's no repose in mirages. Though they look comforting from a distance, when we arrive, there's only more desert. And yet, the home houses. You can even go back there. In the sixth stanza, in the wake of the home, Rich tells us, any time you go back, where absence began, the kitchen faucet sticks in a way you know. You have to pull the basement door in before drawing the bolt. The last porch step is still loose. The water from the tap is the old drink of water. Any time you go back, the familiar underpulse will start throbbing. Home, home. And the hole torn and patched over will gape unseen again. We return again to where absence begins. The absence of the familiar that is itself familiar, that breaking whose break itself is not the point but is only the opportunity to point in a direction, in the direction of being, to fall back on Heidegger's language. And I guess I can't give a presentation on Heidegger, poetry, and language without somewhere mentioning that Heidegger says language is the house of being, right? So duty fulfilled, language is the house of being, right? And of course, this is a house of absence, of nothing, but still the home houses, and we take the mirage that dwells within as a revealed truth, aletheic, perhaps. The familiar here is not familiar. The return already marks an absence. Memories fog the window panes. We see through the glass, though in an obscure way. The scene is framed, but the resolution is low. As much as we remember, there still remains the whole, torn and patched over, gaping unseen, memory begetting forgetting, begetting memory. Caught between, at home, in transit, the very meaning of things emerging from this oscillation, but emerging from the destruction of the old, of the familiar, of the structure that housed the beings we knew. And yet, oscillation as an ontological principle cannot merely be a destabilizing force, contrary to Vadimo's emphasis. After all, the destabilizing effects of oscillation, even under Vadimo's interpretation, should never be confused with an absolute lack of order, for it is not equivalent in any way to disorder. Further, there must be something there which is itself unstable. Language is itself unstable. It slides about, it changes. Words take on new meaning and new shades of meaning. They're inflected differently in different contexts for different people. We can see this movement and are still able to discern what once was. It is not as if the change results in total annihilation, and in fact it could not, or we would never even recognize the new. This is, covertly, why it is important to recognize the work of repetition 
and production in the syntheses of the imagination. We must carry forward what was in order to establish what is, even to anticipate what is yet to come, and here we are brought into the temporality of the poetic. Once struck by the blow, the shock that follows is not a perpetual shock. Let us just focus on the shock for a moment because I think we're beginning to move beyond this whole Vadimo Heidegger Benjamin apparatus. For Benjamin, the shock is an overwhelming experience. In poetry, Baudelaire is especially important to Benjamin, who says that Baudelaire, quote, speaks of a duel, uh, a duel between consciousness and the shocks of the so called external world, uh, and that this duel is the creative process itself, right? And he wanted to, quote, place the shock experience at the very center of artistic work, right? Bald uh, uh, Benjamin thinks Baudelaire wanted to place the shock there. However, Baudelaire, or even the Dadaists, for example, relied mostly on moral shock, according to uh, Benjamin, while the technologically driven shock of the cinema produced a physical shock. So for an example of this, just think of the prose poem, The Rope, by Baudelaire, right? Uh, Baudelaire dedicated this to Edouard Ma uh, Manet, and it's a, a story about a child model uh, who hangs himself because the artist threatens to send him back to its poor family, and the mother comes wanting the piece of rope that he hung himself with, and the artist at first thinks, oh, she wants it, you know, in memory of her child, and it turns out the script is totally flipped. She wants it to sell it, right? I mean, so that's the kind of moral shock I think I think Benjamin wants to point out um, in in Baudelaire, right? But I don't know that that's any less physical. So any anyway, we'll we'll get to that. Hold on, we'll get to that. So Benjamin's very critical of cinema because of the way it overwhelms audience with shock after shock, image after image, and neutralizes the audience's ability to mediate these shocks, right? Um, it leaves them at the mercy of the filmmaker, whose mechanical reproduction assaults their sen senses in an order too rapid for them to cope with. Right? So there are vestiges, and I think probably more than just vestiges, of the Kantian focus on autonomy here, one that the poet herself may not share, and in fact may be antithetical to the ontological moment provided in the oscillation of poetic language. Uh, so, for instance, Muriel Rukeyser uh, wrote about poetry's film-like elements of form in her uh, Life of Poetry, where she says that poetry should approach language to, quote, as we use it, as a process in which motion and relationship are always present. And she stridently demands that we, again to quote, dismiss every static pronouncement, every verdict which treats poetry as static. So Rukeyser speaks here to the threat of poetry, a threat, I think, perhaps unrecognized by Benjamin, who, with Heidegger, maybe romant romanticizes poetry as something more austere and uncorrupted than maybe is warranted. Uh, but regardless of these uh, romanticisms, I, I think poetry escapes capture in this movement. It overflows, and in its excess produces a shock that is no less physical than moral. The words on the page, their manipulation, the advance of the new in the wake of the clearing of the old affects us. Affects and effect. I mean, it's just that whole distinction becomes suspect, right? We watch as meaning melts and shifts before our eyes and must blink as the transformation shines forth and strikes us with the blow. And it is only once we are in the thrall of the shock that the new steps forth and calls to us. In a sense, we must surrender to the poem and allow it to wash over us. Adrienne Rich herself identifies two varieties of poetry in Rookeiser, two streams that both poets seek to bring together in one uh, sort of grand poetic gesture. Rich identifies, quote, the poetry of unverifiable fact, that which emerges from dreams, sexuality, subjectivity, and the poetry of documentary fact, literally accounts of strikes, wars, geographical and geological details, actions of actual persons in history, scientific inventions, end quote. So again, you see this echo of Kant and Benjamin, that clash between the inner and outer forms, between my subjective contribution and the facts that impress upon me what is given in passive intuition to be worked on by the imagination and the production and reinstantiation of sense. We can see how Rukeyser builds on pre-given cultural understandings to push us forward into uncharted territory, exactly where she takes up the mythologized poet Orpheus in her work, The Poem as Mask. Rukeyser writes in dramatic form, Orpheus, when I wrote of the woman in their dances and wildness, 
It was a mask. On their mountain, God hunting, singing, in orgy, it was a mask. When I wrote of the God, fragmented, exiled from myself, his life, the love gone, down with song, it was myself, split open, unable to speak, in exile from myself. There is no mountain, there is no God, there is memory of my torn life, myself split open in sleep, the rescue child beside me among the doctors and a word of rescue from the great eyes, no more masks, no more mythologies. Now for the first time the God lifts his hand, the fragments join in me with their own music. Again, we can see this oscillation between the being and the not being of the gods, of the divinity of the gods and the transcendence of the mortals themselves, the transcendent as they overstep themselves in time. In Rookeiser, we must intuit the difference between the divine and mortal intention, again, as treated in medieval philosophy as the difference between bringing something forth into actuality and bringing something forth merely into sensible presence. Right, divinity brings forth into actuality with its intention, while mortals just bring forth this sort of presence, right? So the development of Kantian philosophy in the aftermath of Cartesian rationalism forever usurped this mode of creation, placing human cognition in the position of the divine in which the mortal intuition now brought forth into actuality the being of beings. And this is where we get stranded in postmodernity, right, with social construction and all that kind of thing, so... The fragments join in me with their own music, she says. And yet, here the split between the outer and inner appear breached. And this breach itself is not the point, but points toward the basic attunement of thinking, toward the thing that is thought. Not thought as the creation of my own fancy, but thought from the phenomenon itself, which gives to my imagination that which is to be rendered sensible. Poetry has opened us to the spontaneity of thinking itself, the rupture of the new from the familiar, the novel emerging from that which has come before, the pattern morphing even as it is repeated. I want to tempt us to think, and so I am tempted to leave things as they are, to leave us here on the shore of the new, blinking in the sun, still struggling to overcome the shock to our senses. But before I abandon us so abruptly, Without conclusion, I want to return once more to literature, to the uh, Austrian uh, Robert Musel, the great uh, modernist uh, novelist who wrote Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften, translated typically as The Man Without Qualities. Musel writes of thought, and it is with his attempt to think the thinking of thought that I will leave us. Thinking, Musel says, quote, comes about not very differently from a dog with a stick in its mouth trying to get through a narrow door. He will turn his head left and right until the stick slips through. We do much the same thing, but with the difference that we don't make indiscriminate attempts, but already know from experience approximately how it's done. The slipping through takes the clever fellow just as much by surprise as it does the dim fellow. It is suddenly there, one perceptibly feels slightly disconcerted because one's ideas seem to have come of their own accord instead of waiting for their creator. This disconcerting feeling is nowadays called intuition by many people who would formerly have called it inspiration. End quote. So let us now imagine the movement of poetry. Let it strike us. Feel the shock of this blow. And in its wake, watch at last, as that which we could not see steps forth as that which it is. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. We have uh, 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, so open the floor at this point. Yes, sir. Sorry for walking in late, so I'm not sure if you covered this in the first little bit or not. But I had a question about, towards the end about uh, you're making a distinction between bringing forth into actuality and bringing forth just sort of into imaginative presence. Mm -hmm. right? And that the former is sort of the activity of divinity and intellectual intuition uh, versus uh, 
you were lining Cousin Descartes in the second half, and I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this is a bit of the presumed Heideggerian background. This is really essential to how Heidegger understands the history of metaphysics as ontotheology. So on the one hand, in the medieval period, you, I mean, Husserl is re-sort of invigorating this talk about intention, which was a big deal in the Middle Ages. But the difference in the Middle Ages being that God, when God intended, it brought things into being, like really made them actual. When I intend, it's just, you know, my, you know, direction toward it. So what happens then with Descartes is Descartes really... He puts all of the burden for having our knowledge on us, on the cogito, on the I think. And that it begins this movement that Kant, I mean, in one way, <clears throat> Descartes attempts to do this, but he doesn't give a positive account of it. So he wants to place it on us, but he gives a negative account. We're insubstantial, right? Or we're, our substance is immaterial. It's a negative definition. And Kant comes in and tries to say, okay, well, insofar as I'm constituted, I'm constituted temporally because that's the form of inner intuition and that's how I get to the a perception because I can intuit, I can deduce that from the perturbations of the manifold if they're given and I think always you know, accompanies that and so on and so forth. But what is happening is that more and more and more we're getting reified to the point where the only thing that ever brings anything forth is my subjectivity. So that finally, whenever you get to Derrida, who's criticizing representation, he's saying, you know, there's no outside of the text, right? It's always just, you know, it's language all the way down. And you get these sort of theories of social construction that, no, my language and my discourse brings into being actually the things that exist, right? So, I mean, that's a little, that's my, kind of my own spin on Heidegger's general story about the history of, of metaphysics, so... Uh, I assumed some of that background uh, here. Is that is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you really want, uh, Heidegger does this very extensively in a great uh, 27 lecture course translated as the basic problems of phenomenology. Really excellent, excellent. Uh, he just goes through very, the first whole half of the book is just his deconstruction of the history of metaphysics. It could be seen in many ways as the, as the start of the, of the missing division of being and time. I think that interpreters generally accept that that with the Kant book com kind of completes the being in time project. But it's kind of an advertisement for being in time too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, oh, so I just Here's published this, this book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks, Donna, for the paper. I'm sorry I had to get up and close the door, but you were doing a good job reading the Rookheiser, and there was this dissonance with voices in the hallway, and I was stinging from the ears. <laughs> but it's nice to hear, and I think in general in poetry, it's nice to hear different voices, not to draw such a stark gender um, line here, but it's nice to hear male voices read female poets and vice versa, um, because I think there's different intonations and sort of like nuances you got to. So I like the way you read the Rookheiser. Um, but I guess this is more of a comment, but I was actually surprised at sort of a tame Audrey and Rich poem, and I think the line with the contradiction did a really good job of demonstrating, I think that's when you were talking about uh, the blow, um, and sort of that space you're in, but I also thought that poem itself is pretty tame and moves pretty methodically through, you know, to borrow like the Roth, that's sort of an American pastoral or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I wonder um, if, if you thought about maybe looking at this particularly from that era or a little earlier poetry that is in fact a little more shocking mm -hmm. poetry that's a little more even you know vulgar mm -hmm. and a little more stark in its in its delineation even mm -hmm. and um, and in its method you know mm -hmm. something that I love Rich but I think she's sort of part of that post beat kind of reestheticization of poetry mm -hmm. um, I think Elizabeth. Bishops there, you know, I think eventually like a James Merrill, who's sort of like, yeah, Kerouac never really said anything. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like a really famous poet, but what was it? My two cents. Yeah. Is um, Kerouac worth reading? Probably not. But mm -hmm. the point is, is like there's a there's a different kind of shock there. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, um, why did it, why or have you thought about picking something that's a little more profane and ostensibly shocking in that way? Yeah. Um, so actually, that point is really well taken. 
part of the reason why I thought Rich's poem worked is because of how tame it was to start. Because what I really want to show is that we have to kind of repeat this basis. And we have to like, and I think that even more shocking poets probably do exactly that because they're using words, even if they're using them in a new way, they're using words that we're familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just think that sort of the tameness of that poem allowed me to more readily make the point, whereas it would be harder to read that point, although I think possible because I'm, I, I think I'm talking about something ontological here. Okay. I mean, because so I think I could put up. I think I could put up E equals MC squared and one of Planck's constants and show how those two uh, equations that could be combined at their basis to yield an oscillation. And in fact, they do because, because mass is equal to energy and all that kind of stuff. Um, you have the mass of any object and it gives you all the things you need to know about its oscillation, about its frequency, which is a temporal structure. So I mean, I. Yeah. So in a sense, it's, it's the it's the everydayness that you select in that poem precisely yeah. because then when that moment of the blow comes, it's almost more emphatic because in a way we're we're just capable of understanding the everydayness of it. Yeah. Or yeah. No, that's a great answer. Yeah. I appreciate that. I didn't mean to. No, 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 no not at all. Test, mm -mm. Although I stand by my two cents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Time. But I, but that's what I was thinking. But I see what you're saying is that in a way something that's shocking in that ostensible fashion then what you lose is that precise, if I understood you correctly, notion of movement, which is a very ontological thing, and frankly, if historical in any way, it's something we have to be able to relate to in some kind of communal fashion, like the everydayness of middle middle class, yeah. you know, yeah. American and, life of the 20th century. Yeah. Whatever. And I kind of like Rich's conservatism. <laughs> in well, before, I mean... Not, <laughs> A form, formal conservative, because uh, she's, no, of course, true. not conservative in any yeah, sense. Yeah, because yeah. the poem that I was thinking of, too, was like diving into the rack or something mm -hmm. like that. I mm -hmm. thought it might work in certain places for you with what you were saying. Yeah. Um, but I love it, too. That's why I said that re-aestheticization that happens around like the early 70s, yeah. which I think is a huge response to beat culture and open form. Yeah. But um, sorry, I just want to challenge you on that, but thanks for Yeah, no, thank you. Paper, thank you. Yeah, I always appreciate your comments on poetry. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, just just a clarifying question. I wonder if you could uh, revisit or just summarize your engagement with bottom line in this. Like you you seem to be uh, wanting to point to a shortcoming of mm -hmm. those two positions or something. And uh, what? Yeah, I don't know if you could you could articulate that. Yeah. I just really think that Vadimo here doesn't go far enough in his interpretation of, of Heidegger uh, or Benjamin. He wants to really focus, and he gets kind of stuck on the destabilization. And if I, I'll just relay it to Heidegger, because that's something I know a little bit, a little bit better. Um, when you're explaining the hammer to somebody that it breaks, right? The point isn't that it's broken, right? It's that the breaking allows us to get at these ontological questions, right? So Vadimo also is, almost seems stuck on the breaking. Like he's stuck on this uh, on this destabilization when in fact the whole point of the stabilization is to like open the space in which something can like step forth. Like you're, as you're in, saying, to the kind of poetry is such that he's deep, uh, of the nature book is such that he's obsessed with the yes, and yeah, he's yeah. And indeed, his just his conception of art and the aesthetic experience generally, yeah. I think, is just stuck on in this breaking and is unable to see why the breaking is important. Right? It's not the it's not the fact that's not the banal fact that it's broken. Yeah. Right? No, it's that the breaking opens the possibility of this ontological moment. You know, so, yeah. Um, I have a, a comment and a question. Um, I thought it was interesting what you said about the, this exact point about destabilization and kind of its correlate with stabilization and to keep as a pair. Um, the, our professor of phenomenology here, uh, Monsignor Sokolowski, um, is very insistent on the idea that phenomenology works with polarities that can't be collapsed onto either side. So he says, there's a certain essay where he says, we have to avoid the metaphysics of presence as much as the metaphysics of absence. And so you have to keep presence and absence together, identity and manifestation. They can't be collapsed. 
but you have to see how they're correlated with each other. Um, and I thought that, that came out uh, interestingly in your presentation. Uh, my question is about your, uh, so sort of the philosophical background of what you're doing here. Um, it seems to me, uh, my understanding of phenomenology is that Heidegger and even Husserl, um, Husserl not till later, um, are concerned, are, are very aware of this um, need that philosophy has of being able to use words in a new way. Um, so, I mean, Husserl talks about it in terms of getting into the transcendental attitude, but I think um, you could put it, in, you could um, kind of desubjectivize it and put it in terms of trying to figure out what you're saying when you're, when you're speaking philosophically. Um, so, and, but I don't know if I see, and I, and I see that as a way of kind of escaping our subjectivity, um, or at least seeing how subjectivity is, doesn't mean, doesn't amount to arbitrariness or something like that. Um, so I'm wondering how uh, Kant figures into this. You seem to be aligning Heidegger and Kant um, yeah. as a kind of background. Yeah. And I, I saw what you were doing. I saw it related to at least my understanding of phenomenology. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you have a different understanding, or, or how do you see Kant fitting into that? Yeah, um, I'm a, a terrible, heterodox reader of Kant. Um, I've... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Heidegger says that he sought in Kant the answers to the questions that he sought. That uh, Kant takes us up to this threshold that he then, for reasons that you can only kind of speculate about, doesn't sort of follow through to its its logical conclusion. Um, and so, for me... Kant is radically transforming the base kind of language that we use philosophically. And then um, it, it, part of why I think he can't do that, and this is, this is something Chris Yeomans talks about, a Hegel scholar that's at, at Purdue, that <clears throat> Kant had this revolutionary program, but he had to like fight on every side to like maintain. And so he was always being distracted from what was really like at, at issue and then someone like Hegel kind of once Kant becomes standard and everyone accepts it then Hegel can go on and do this their, his own like thing but really building on um, on on Kant so I agree uh, my, my basic point is that what I agree with Heidegger is that Kant is the person who really drives home the fact that all thinking is finite thinking and that it's only out of finite thinking that you get into any sort of, you get any insight, you know. Um, but that then starts to collapse and break down some of these old, you know, d ideas that we have about, like, I mean, from that perspective, with, if all thinking is finite thinking, Hegel's project then starts to become nonsense, right? You send a ladder of reason into the mind of God and have this, you know, that just doesn't, doesn't fly. Um, that said, though, I, maybe I'm doing violence to the text. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, my dissertation advisor is a Deleuzian, and Deleuze, for Deleuze, philosophy is create concrete concept creation. So, you know, I, I could be, I could be like hat, taking a hatchet to Kant or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, is that help? I mean, is that? I'm sorry. Is that helpful? No, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I was sort of wondering if you think Kant gives us the resources to understand how um, in our subjectivity we can take a step beyond ourselves because um, on a certain mm. reading of Kant you know yeah it's it's where we're trapped in ourselves yeah he starts he starts okay. he, uh, he starts I sympathize but, with that reading I just yeah I think he starts to but for Kant I do want to be clear I think it's in the text the transcendent is still something toward which we step and then Heidegger wants to take that and say no the transcendent isn't some something that's con that's not minding the ontological distinction. It's not something toward which you overstep. It is the overstepping of Dasein and its temporal structure. So, you know. yeah, that's helpful. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so I, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about how you're reading um, Benjamin's conception of shock experience as it relates to these different media. Mm -hmm. um, so, with respect to Dada, you've talked a little bit about mortal shock, 
um, and venue kind of things. Dot is almost anticipating a new medium, namely film, that can kind of like integrate these shock experiences in a way that we can experience them. Um, we can kind of become more attuned to them, not just in film, but in the way that in modern urban life sort of forces us to deal with these shocks. Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you kind of read that shift, um, whether you think uh, cinema in some sense is where we get a genuine or even maybe a progressive kind of shock experience, whereas Ben Me talks a little bit about how we popular audiences have sort of reactionary uh, reactions to Dada um, and maybe even photo layer mm -hmm. shock experiences in poetry. So maybe just talking about shock experience in relation to media a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I admittedly, I may have a sophomoric understanding of, of this issue in, in Benjamin, um, <clears throat> because I, I tend to read him as being very negative on film. I mean, I kind of see what you're saying in terms of getting an authentic shock, but there's a real issue here that the th shock can't be coped with. That even though the speed of the Metropolitan is like ramping up, there's still a sense in which I can kind of take that in stride and deal with those shocks. Whereas in the cinema, I'm assaulted to such an extent that I can't even, I'm totally get at the mercy or given over to the filmmaker in, in, in some way. And I mean, I know that Benjamin associates this somehow with, a, with the loss of Halo, with the loss of the aura, yeah. um, but that, that bit of it is not exactly clear to me. So I would actually be happy to hear your, any, if you have any thoughts on that um, um, I mean, as well. So I tend to read that as more of a positive mm -hmm. um, depiction. And I think Benjamin, yeah, we are sort of distracted in films and completely absorbed, but he thinks that that can be positive in a certain sense. Um, because he thinks that certain sort of art forms, and the example he gives besides film is architecture, can be sort of absorbed unconsciously um, in a productive way that sort of changes our um, habits of att attention. Um, and it can be obviously manipulated and bad and negative. Um, but I don't think he thinks that's necessary to the medium itself. He mm -hmm. thinks that's part of the way that film is used in, in both fascist and um, capitalist society. So, yeah, I don't have necessarily a strong take. I was just interested in your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Admi uh, admittedly, my grasp of Benjamin is the, is the weakest of all of the thinkers that I tried to. And Vadimo sort of forced me into into that <laughs> because he connects these two things very closely but again it may be a little bit of that i've picked up too much of vadimo's interpretation because you could do the same thing with heidegger i mean yeah. people have this interpretation of heidegger like he hates technology as some kind of luddite and that's i don't think that's right i, I mean that, that's doesn't seem so right. i could be making that kind of error with regards to benjamin in this instance yeah oh, i think a lot of people make the error that interpret that Benjamin's interpretation of film is actually too positive. Um, mm. So it's an interesting thing to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank, thank you for that. I take that into certain uh, consideration. All right. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Alexander 